Well, th thanks for the kind introduction. I am very flattered by your invitation today. I'm grateful to be with all of you, and actually everything that you mentioned in my CV is, uh, is untrue. Uh, the, the reality is, is um, I am the uh, lead guitarist um, for the thrash metal band in the 1980s, Metallica. That's me um, in the middle with the glasses. <laughs> I have since had my piercings and tattoos removed, and I was a lot taller then. So some of my journeys in, into the mind have have felt a bit like stories. So I've given this story some chapters. And by the end of this talk, I'd, I'd like to have covered the following seven for you. In the first chapter, I'll offer a significant confession that I think will give this talk a, a bit of shock value. Uh, chapter two is a question. And chapter three is a very brief, but I think a very central message of the entire talk. Chapter four is an acronym, which I'll talk about. And six gives you a peek at what research of this kind can produce, because in chapter five, that's where I'm going to talk to you about the Mining Mental Health Project. In the final chapter, I'd like to bring us right back to the beginning and offer a summary and some suggestions. I, I would like to leave you with a take-home message as well. Chapter one. So in the small town where, where I grew up, there were only two religions. There was Roman Catholicism, and there was NHL hockey. And sometimes people practiced one religion or the other, but most times people practiced both. And sometimes they practiced it simultaneously. So at our parish, Our Lady of the Hat Trick, it wasn't unusual for the priest to wear a Montreal Canadiens jersey over his robe during Mass. And this made for some strange sermons because while you learned about things like heaven and hell at church, you'd also learn about why Montreal would win the Stanley Cup again. My apologies to Ted, I recall your photo here. and We didn't pray much for them, which could explain a few things. Um, now, at that age that, that, that I was at, you start asking life's more intriguing questions. Like, where do your parents work? Where do babies come from? And what happens after you die? And the answer to that last question was pretty simple. You go to one of two places. If you'd been a good person, you went up, because somewhere up there is this heaven thing. But if you were bad, then that was pretty clear what happened to you. You'd, you'd go down. Somewhere where it was really dark and hot, and I was told, very unpleasant, and you'd go there to suffer and to suffer a lot. Now, for a little kid, this place sounded awfully frightening. In fact, the images of hell that people my age and older were given were those usually inspired by Dante. Now, Dante, you might recall, is that famous Italian poet from the Middle Ages who wrote, he wrote the Divine Comedy. Now, the Divine Comedy is considered the greatest literary work in the Italian language. And here, hell is depicted as these nine concentric circles of suffering located within the earth. So you can imagine my confusion when the answer to one of the first questions of childhood I asked my neighborhood friends, where does your parent work, produced the answer, underground. And this was the answer of most kids in my neighborhood. Well, in my little kid's mind, if you were underground, you were either bad, dead, suffering, and probably all of those things. So I think you know where the story is going. Anyway, very early on, I, I often wondered about what and who was below the ground I walked on. It was, and still remains for me now, rather fascinating to me to have minds in minds. Now, I'll share something else with you now. Uh, this is the shock value part. And, and I'm glad you're all sitting, because I've, I've actually never come out and told anyone this. But I'm, but I'm coming out now, and I'm finally admitting to this, is I actually never followed the religion of NHL hockey. 
It's true. It's true. I know it's blasphemous, and I know it is unpatriotic, but it is true. But if you really want to know what I do love and follow quite religiously, in fact, I must confess, it is baseball. And even Wayne Gretzky preferred baseball growing up. He said it recently in an interview that his real dream as a kid was to be a shortstop for the Detroit Tigers. And that's funny, because that was my dream too. The only thing I was missing was, was talents, and um, I think height, and weight, and speed, and agility, and all those things, but those are details, really. And, and so I turned my mind to something else. I thought for a while, well, then maybe it'll be basketball. But then it became quite a, apparent to me that my physique would, uh, would not allow that, that the only thing that I'd be dunking would be cookies, and that I knew quite quickly. Now, by the way, I want to share something else with you. Now, Sudbury has this very, very rich tradition of baseball that you might not know about. In fact, for a time, mining companies recruited some workers on the basis of their baseball skills. They had really well-developed leagues back then. And here's a photo. This is circa, circa 1950. This is Queen's Athletic Field, for those of you who are familiar. And the estimated count here was 5,000 people watching a ball game in Sudbury. Imagine that. Now, I'd like to share another secret with you. Laurentian University is going to have its very first ever varsity baseball team in 2018. So, I'd love to talk to you about that at some point as well. So, if you have to talk about sponsors and everything else. But I'm not here for money, I'm here to talk about other things. But why baseball? Why this ongoing fascination that, that borders, I think, on obsession for me? Well, for one thing, I think it's a game defined, it's defined by failure. And redemption, where the best hitters in the world fail about seven times out of ten. I also think it's the powerful sentimentality that comes with baseball. Baseball marks the seasons. Baseball announces the arrival of spring. Baseball is synonymous with fatherhood, that fabulous day when your dad maybe goes outside with you into the sunshine when school was out and maybe taught you how to catch, throw, and hit. I think something very Darwinian happens just then at that moment. I think there is something that pokes at our hard wires of our Neanderthal brains at that moment, back to a time when we used to run, hit, and catch, run after the things on, on the ground or in the air just to survive to the next day. But maybe it's the power of other childhood memories. Maybe it was that day your parents brought you to see your first big league game, and you sat beside them, and they bought you a hot dog and lemonade, and you basked in the sun, and you smelled the freshly cut grass of a moist infield. Or maybe it's a night game, when the wonderful aromas of the park, when they rise gently like, like incense into the night. And during a game, you get to talk, and you get to listen. About the game, about your heroes, about school, maybe about your first crush, your dreams and your hopes, because in baseball there is no clock, there are many pauses and plenty of time to actually be with someone. There are no time limits. The defensive team has the ball. In baseball, even when all is quiet, a thousand things are happening. But perhaps most of all, I like how baseball is meant to be studied. And baseball has been studied with numbers and with words. So I know at this point you might be asking, okay, now wait a minute. What does this have to do with mining? You're, you're probably thinking, well, I thought it was at a mining conference. Um, so what does baseball have to do with my mining research? Well, the answer is a lot. And the other answer is, I hope a lot more. In 1858, a sports writer in New York, Henry Chadwick, I apologize, he couldn't be with us today. Look, if I have to start explaining my jokes to you guys, we're going to have a big trouble. But Henry Chadwick was interesting because he invented the box score. 
The box score was the very first use of statistics to help describe the sport, and the box score gave people an opportunity to tabulate and to summarize important events from any baseball game in a consistent way. Fast forward about 100 years, and David Smith creates the retro sheet. With the goal of computerizing the box scores of every major league baseball game ever played. Chapter two. Will that be quantitative or qualitative, sir? The answer is yes. I will have both. Now, you might be wondering if people collect a lot of data in the game of baseball. And the answer is a resounding yes. In fact, I thought I'd give you some examples. Is that okay with you? Oh, no, I've got the mic, so I don't think you have a choice. It's just like the university. It's, it's, it's great. Uh, one of my students, by the way, saw this slide and said, Le Riviere, this is too busy. What are you doing showing a slide with that many words? And I said, I'm doing it on purpose for effect. That's still true, Gomez. So here's some common batting statistics. You might be familiar with some of them. Singles and doubles and triples and home runs. We count and tabulate those things all the time. It doesn't stop there. There's things like the equivalent average, the walk to strikeout ratio, the ground ball to fly ball ratio, the gross production average. There's some other batting statistics here on base percentage, slugging average. Uh, and here's a good one, the total average. This is total bases plus walks plus hit by pitch plus steals minus caught stealing divided by at bats minus hits plus caught stealing plus grounded into double plays. We track that data for ball players. Of course, it doesn't just track hitting. Take a look at these base running statistics. These go on forever. Here's even a UBR, the ultimate base running statistic. For their part, pitching statistics can go on forever, so here are just a few. Of course, most of you are familiar with some of these. Base on balls, batters faced, completed games, which never happens anymore. Here's some other familiar stats. Hits allowed and innings pitch and strikeouts. But there are some sexier ones too. How about this one? This is the last one, I think, on the screen. The P-Nerd. This stands for expected aesthetic pleasure of watching an individual pitcher. Now, I suspect this might correlate highly with how tight a pitcher's pants are <laughs> and the camera angle, perhaps, but I, I digress. And on and on it goes for data collected on pitchers. I mean, just look at these stats. I mean, it's an absolute orgy for math mathematicians here. It goes on and on, the same with fielding and I think I've made my point. Now, if we wanted to be really fancy about this, you would call all these things that I just showed you quantitative statistical data. Now, if you really wanted to bore people at social functions, you would call them descriptive quantitative statistical data. In other words, the numbers explain things as they are. They are not designed to predict things. Prediction requires some nifty math, and I'll come back to that later. Anyways, to summarize the last several slides, almost everything that every ball player does in the major leagues is recorded, whether it's pitching, running, hitting, or fielding. And this work contributes to the history of baseball by contributing to very huge data sets. I think this helps explain baseball's very rich traditions. I think it helps ex explain its rituals. And I think it helps explain its ongoing history. Because Major League Baseball has found a way to immortalize its players through numbers. But you know what? I think baseball immortalizes its players through its stories and anecdotes through its quotations as well. And how about we call that stuff qualitative data? And there might be some you might even recognize. Not sure if you recall the great New York Yankee, Yogi Berra, but you might recognize some of his quotes. They're often called Yogiisms. 
Vera, you might recall, left us some wonderful gems. Here's one. Baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. Here's one. Little League Baseball is a very good thing because it keeps parents off the streets. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Or how about this? I mean, this is, this is precious. You can observe a lot by watching. Or always go to other people's funerals, otherwise they won't come to yours. We made too many wrong mistakes. And at one point told his friend, you better cut the pizza in four slices because I'm not hungry enough for six. Never answer an anonymous letter. Now that one was good, guys. No, really. <laughs> he once told his um, players uh, to pair up in threes and noticed a switch hitter once and he said he hits from both sides, he's amphibious. Or how about this? It was impossible to get a conversation going. Everybody was talking too much. It ain't the heat, it's the humility, and finally one I try to use a lot. If you ask me anything I don't know, I'm not going to answer. Now, there's some other quotes that we'll call qualitative data too. Here's one from Babe Ruth. He says, every strike brings me closer to the next home run. How about that as a life philosophy almost? Bill Veek says there are only two seasons, winter and baseball. Applies to Sudbury. I could never be a manager, Mickey Mantle says. All I had was natural ability. And maybe my favorite, Jim Bouton. You see, you spend a good piece of your life gripping a baseball, and in the end, it turns out it was the other way around the whole time. Now, if there's one quote or qualitative data you remember from this entire presentation, I hope it's this one from Mickey Mantle. Another great New York Yankee slugger, he's born in 1931. Mantle said, it's unbelievable how much you don't know about the game you've been playing all your life. And I'd like you to keep that quote in mind because for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to suggest to you that it is unbelievable how much we don't know about the game of mining that many of you in this room have been playing all your lives. Yes, that was a short chapter, chapter four. So like many good stories, the beginning of this one maybe is hard to pinpoint. But if I was looking for a beginning to the story of Crush, it seems to have started in an airport about 10 years ago during a discussion between Leo Gerard at USW and Mark Kudafani then at INCO. The story goes that both men thought it would be a great idea to create a center for occupational health and safety, a place where good ideas might collide, where ideas could marinate a little bit, where the lives and well-being and the health of workers could be given some long and hard thinking and research. And what better place than Sudbury, they thought, to do just that. Now, meanwhile, at Laurentian University, a few researchers were busy studying occupational health and safety about workers and workplaces, but we worked in re relative isolation, as researchers tend to often do. But with the resolve of people like Leo Gerard and the strong leadership of Dr. Tammy Eager, the Center for Research in Occupational Health and Safety was born at Laurentian. The acronym became known as CROSH, and I am hesitant to use the French version of the acronym because there's always a chance my mother might be in the room. <laughs> that particular joke is funnier when you're French, by the way, just, just, just saying. Or from Hanmer. So as Crosh or Chris began its life, <laughs> you made me say it. Several researchers began meeting in groups. Well, actually, it was only Dr. Eager and I, I think, at first. Uh, Dr. Eager here? Yes, you are. Um, so I'll be careful. So these group meetings included uh, me and Dr. Eager, and that was it. And we had these early morning breakfast meetings, and we'd have them at Glorious. Those of you from Sudbury know where that is. And Glorious is great, because I, I used to really love their huge breakfasts. The problem was, is when you go to breakfast with Dr. Eager, she'll order first, because I'm polite and then she'll order something really healthy. So I would go in hoping to get the trucker special, 
And I always end up having oatmeal just to kind of, you know, follow Tammy's lead. So, Tammy, I have another confession to make today. I don't really like oatmeal. I felt judged. So just for once, I'm having the trucker special. Anyway, as we batted our thoughts around at this breakfast table from time to time, we had this one particularly crazy idea, and I'd like to share it with you now. Here's what we thought. We thought, what if rather than impose our research ideas onto other people, what if we listened carefully to what was important to those we would be studying? What if we left our ivory towers, we mingled with some real people, and asked them how their health and well-being was being affected by their work? What were their concerns? What were their hopes? What were their worries? And what if we sat with union and corporate leaders, and policymakers, and government folks, and regulators, and most importantly, most importantly of all, what if we sat down with people from the communities in which we worked, that we live in, and we ask them about their thoughts about scientific projects. I know it sounds crazy. <laughs> but for many academics, this actually is crazy. And in some academic circles, this type of research is treated with at least a bit of suspicion. But there is a fancy word for that type of research. It's called participatory or action research. And we were sold on that idea. Anyways, I think this approach has allowed us and has allowed CROSS to never forget who we would be doing the research for. And guess what? It's not about the researchers. It would be about the workers. And I think that has helped us a lot. The other thing that helps me, I think, a lot is being with patients a lot and spending time with them. And when you're truly present to someone else's suffering, it actually is really hard to make it about yourself. So chapter five, Minds in Minds. This is the Valet USW Mining Mental Health Project that I'd now like to talk to you about. So after all these breakfasts with Dr. Eager, I wouldn't even start with uh, Dr. Dorman. I mean, now you're into fruit and really, really healthy stuff. So. Um, we continued our, to, to, to meet, and, and Dr. Dorman joined us, and, and our director continues to give us great leadership. We set off to meet as, as many real people as we could. And one theme kept coming back again and again, because this is going to be participatory research, right? So we were consulting. And one theme came back again and again is, can you tell us a bit about the well-being of our workforce? Can you tell us a bit about their mental health? And that was a good question to ask, because the reality of this is we know very little. I've been involved in at least a few national studies, and I can tell you a whole lot about police officers and firefighters and military folks, and tell you about healthcare workers and people who work in prisons and people who live in prisons for a very long time. But if you ask me, what does the scientific literature tell us about mental health and well-being of mining workers, you are really out of luck. As Mickey Mantle would say, it's unbelievable how much you don't know about the game you've been playing all your life. But I want to tell you a bit of some of what we do know, because there is a bit of information out there. The cost of mental health disability is about $50 billion in this country. In terms of the actual number of workdays that are lost to short-term disability, Heart conditions average about 37 days. It's about the same for back pain. It's about the same for hypertension at about 28 days. Diabetes, about 26 days. But if you take a look at mental health, you'll see 72 days. That's a lot of time. And by the way, I think this is an extraordinarily gross underestimation of the true number. The reality is people don't like talking about these issues. And in my experience, don't even like talking about these issues with their family dog. I mean, eventually they'll talk to me about it, that's why they come. But often they will not have spoken any of their fears 
or anxieties or depression or whatever else is going on, or whatever happened underground, they won't necessarily share that with, with anyone. I think that number is an underestimation. As Bear would say, you know, it's 90% it's mental and 50% physical. So I'll tell you what this means, though. Let's say you had a typically sized mining company. What you'd be looking at is about 14,000 lost days per year. And what that means is that 40% of all your lost days going forward now in your mining workforce are a result of mental health claims. That's 40%. I still think it's an underestimation. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. And I want you to think about the amount of money that is spent on things like lubricants, on equipment, on, um, I don't know, even clothing for workers and for companies. But if you really want to know your main cost drivers, what I might suggest you do is have a few chats with your HR folks and maybe visit your uh, Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committees because they have a fairly good feel of what's going on and they can give you some, some data that you might find quite intriguing. When we approached Valet and USW, they had more than a vague sense of this issue. When we met with them to ask them what type of research they needed, they stepped in and they stepped in very, very big. The research project itself was a three-year effort. It was a $400,000 project that was funded by both USW and Valet. So let me tell you just a bit about that study. So before we, we actually started the, the research, we thought, we thought we needed some guiding principles. This thing was large enough to warrant some, some things to live by during the research. And one of them is we would ensure that every stakeholder was involved at every step of the research process. So from the development of our research questions to the part where we deliver our findings and results to other people, we wanted every stakeholder to be involved. That included workers and researchers and government, NGOs, senior union and company officials, and even our students had a voice in the creation of our work and in the delivery of it. Now, did this cause a lot of work for me? The answer is absolutely yes. Did it produce a better product? I am absolutely convinced it will. Now, by the way, when we launched the study, there were ribbon cuttings and stuff and ministers for photo ops and stuff, but one of the first questions that we had from people living elsewhere in the world was, how did you get these people to talk to each other? And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And they said, like, how do you get labor and management to talk about things and agree on things and, and sit at tables together? And I said, I mean, not to brag, but I, I said, it was the easiest part of the project. It, it really was the easiest part of the project. In fact, I told them it hadn't even occurred to me that it ought to be a problem. They didn't like that part. But they said in their places, uh, there are no such discussions. So on matters of health and well-being, on matters of people's lives, it was very easy to find common ground. Second, we wanted to ensure a very, very um, um, effortful piece of science that had integrity. And so we reviewed existing research, of course. We used the best survey instruments that we could find. We chose our variables of interest by consulting. We ran um, some of the preliminary statistical data already. We recruited participants as thoughtfully as we could. We did a lot of work on protecting the data and we kept our ethics boards informed of every step. The third principle we thought we needed to be guided by was that we should advance knowledge in a practical and in an understandable manner. That we would speak the language of our stakeholders. And fourth, that we would share the knowledge that we uh, acquire, first with the Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committee, then perhaps with um, our stakeholders in the community, and in the community of researchers. And finally, we wanted to do things on time, and we wanted to do them on budget. 
I want you to think of the opposite of home renovations, the very opposite of home renovations. On time, on budget, not at all like construction projects. And I think we, we succeeded quite well at that. And these were the main questions of the study. So the first question was, what is the current state of mental health and well-being of mining workers? We want to get a snapshot, a bit like how we do with gathering data for ball players. What is the current state of things? This is purely quantitative, it's descriptive, it's those types of stats. Second question, what factors relate most strongly to or predict the mental health and well-being of mental of, of mining workers, sorry? And this is quantitative data as well. Which factors predict an absence from work? And finally, what factors help predict a return to work following an absence for health-related issues? Those were the four large, high-level guiding questions that we had uh, for this research study. Now, because of the size of this thing, we, we thought we better, we better pilot this questionnaire. Um, let's try to recruit some people to, to test drive it for us. So we did, and it was very helpful. We did this between December 2015 and March 2016. We actually only wanted a sample of 30 people on our pilot study. That's all we needed. We just wanted to get a feel how people were reacting to the questions we were asking them. We wanted to know how long the questionnaire took, etc. cetera. You'll never guess what happened. We only needed 30. 80 people came forward. And we told them, I, we only need 30. Thanks for coming out. We're going to be OK. And many of them were very, very disappointed. Now, of course, we said it's just the pilot study, folks. You can be part of the main study in a few months. But this told me just how far we had already gone on the issue of mental health and on the issue of being able to speak about it. Here you had a bunch of people coming forward and saying, I want to be part of the pilot study. So we had very good feedback from participants. Um, one of the things they told us is they were very happy that the university and Crosh in particular was involved because we were perceived as a neutral third party. We weren't the organization and we weren't um, the union. We were researchers and we assured them right on the consent form that only we would have access to their data. Now, as a result of the pilot project, we modified our questionnaire, given the feedback that we got. And here's what people told us. They said, I think you should ask us more questions about family life and relationships. We want you to ask us about fatigue and about shift work. We want you to ask us a bit about how policies and health and safety are written, but how those things are translated uh, differently on the shop floor. Ask us about that, they said. Ask us about return to work procedures. Ask us about drug and alcohol consumption. In the end, we created a survey with 558 questions. This is longer than any psychological personality test that I can think of. 45 pages and 17 subscales. In total, it took people an average of about 60 minutes to complete. And these are some of the scales we used. We looked at things like PTSD. We thought with mine rescue workers, for instance, there might be some of that going on, and, and maybe some people had some close calls, and, and, and maybe people don't always feel comfortable down there after these uh, accidents and other bad things. We, we asked about depression and anxiety. We administered the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, the Fatigue Severity Scale, the drug questionnaire, the Copenhagen burnout inventory, the relationship assessment scale, satisfaction with work-life balance, perceived stress, job insecurity. We administered the guarding minds at work, the stigma scale for mental health stigma, and the recovery experience questionnaire. Now, so we did the pilot, that was successful. And now it was time to actually engage in the survey. 
Now, there's different ways to run a survey. For instance, you could randomly take a predetermined number of people. You could randomly say, I want 50 people from this site and another 38 from this site, et cetera. Um, there's a fancy word for that, too. It's called stratifying. But we decided to do it differently. What we said we would do is that every employee would have an opportunity to complete the research. We wanted everyone to have a chance to be heard, so everyone at Valet's Ontario operations was invited uh, to participate. Everyone in Ontario at Valet's operations was eligible. Now, at first, I have to tell you, we had some really, really ambitious uh, designs for this thing. We were going to have iPads at every site. We were going to have computer terminals everywhere in the workplace. But even though I love the new technology, I'll confess something else to you. I just don't always trust it. And this, I knew, was going to be exquisitely sensitive data. So I felt strongly that I had to protect it. And we hear about so many data breaches these days, we actually decided we were going to do this whole thing old school. In fact, I decided we were going to do it old school, much to the chagrin of several graduate students. But what we decided is that we would be on site at every site in Ontario at some point between spring 2016 and fall 2016 with very high tech stuff, pencils, clipboards, and questionnaires. That's how fancy we got. And then we kept our surveys locked in cabinets. They're still there now. They're behind locked doors at the university. So if people want to steal our data, they would also have to do it old school. So they'd have to beat down my steel door and then beat down some file cabinets. But here's the thing. Once they got to the questionnaires, there'd be no names on them. So it would be a real waste of their time before they got arrested. Now, Given the sensitivity of the questions, I was actually afraid that very few people would participate. I didn't share that with anyone because I didn't want to you know, be negative or pessimistic. Um, I really didn't think many people would participate despite the good pilot project that we had. But in the end, more than half of the workforce did. 2,224 participants completed the survey for us. Now, I'll admit to this now, it's far beyond my expectations. In fact, a colleague of mine who works in the poli-sci department, he said, you know, Rivera, you know what's going on here? And I said, what's going on? He said, you have twice the typical number of people that people who do polls, pollsters, prior to elections need to get a sense of who's going to win. So we felt that we had a really, really good data set. So chapter six, we're getting near the end. So I, I wanted to give you a sense of what the data could look like in the end, because we, we actually haven't analyzed the data. I mean, this is the fun part of the study. We, we get to crunch all the numbers, but, but we're not finished. In fact, we're just starting. So I thought, okay, I'll give them a sense of what this could look like, and I'll bring you back to a study that, we, that was commissioned by the, uh, the Correctional Service of Canada several, several years ago, where they asked us to help them better understand um, the issue of HIV in penitentiaries. It turns out that the infection rate in our penitentiaries, not that you think about this much in your daily lives, but it's about 15 times that of people in the general community. Now, you might think, well, okay, well, who cares? Well, who cares is they come back to the community and, and often they have uh, children and families and all kinds of stuff. So that was, this was a big issue. Now, we knew anecdotally, through qualitative work, that people do inject drugs in prison, that they pierce, that they give themselves tattoos, but we had no idea of the numbers. We needed quantitative, we needed quantitative data. So here's what they told us. We asked them, do you inject drugs? And the 11% said yes. But then when you asked them, did you use clean equipment, about 44% said, uh, no, it wasn't clean, or I don't know, or I'm not sure. Sexual behavior is in prison at about 66%, and the, um, using condoms um, is actually not a very frequent event, and, and that raises risk uh, quite extraordinarily. 
tattoos in prison? Almost 50% said, yes, I had one done. Was your equipment clean if you ask them? They'll say, I don't know. Or they'll tell you for sure, I don't, it wasn't, because I just shared it. <laughs> Same with piercing, a little lower, but still people are not necessarily mindful of cleaning. Now, okay, so that's nice. Let's go back to baseball for a second. Remember how we collect all this data and we have numbers about people? Ideally, see, if you were a scout, what you would do is you would plug those statistics in what we call a regression. And you would find out the best things that predict future events. And yes, if you're, if you're with the Cubs, um, I have cards. I will volunteer my services to you to help you choose better players by using the data you already have. So this is really neat. I know it doesn't seem neat to you, but it, re it really gets me excited and I, I gesticulate wildly. I'm not gonna go through every number, but I want you to see how these numbers are telling you a story. And I want you to ignore the middle columns just for a second. Why don't you just take a look at the column that says variable and take another look at the column that says odds ratio. So odds ratios describe a multiplication of the odds of an outcome that might occur. If the number is one, the odds are about the same. Today, all I'll say is that if it's less than one, the risk is lower. If it's greater than one, the risk is higher. So take a look at what's happening here. Here's the question. Help us predict who is engaging in high-risk behaviors. And the data tells a story. It says that, for instance, people who are incarcerated a lot and for greater periods of time are at much higher risk. People who are older, however, are at much lower risk. Do, do, you, do you see what's going on there? Okay, say we wanted to tighten it up a bit and say, say the deputy minister says, Lervier, why don't you tell us um, who's injecting drugs? Because I have this $10 million budget or whatever it is, and I need to help solve this problem, help guide me on how to spend this money wisely. And we said, of course, this is what we do. We love this stuff. So take a look here. If you're looking to predict who is going to inject drugs in your penitentiaries, what is that telling you now? The odds ratios here are saying, again, focus your attention on younger folks, forget about the Quebec region, spend more money in the Pacific region, and look at the type of offender that you're dealing with. Do you see? This is magic stuff. This is great. I know I'm more excited than you are right now. <laughs> but but do, you see, do you see where this could go? Okay, so let me just repeat this. I have 2,300 participants in an entire organization. Do you know how many data points that is? That's like over a million data points. Over a million data points. And these are for variables we have not yet even created. And we're going to create some because you know what's going to happen. As soon as we present a bit of data, I know what's going to happen. They're going to say, well, is that true for everyone? Well, what about this site? And what about for women? What about people with a lot of children? What about people who have to raise children while also taking care of elderly parents? What about, what about people who've just started their career? So we're going to break down the data. We're going to do that all summer. That's true, grad students, all summer. <laughs> By the way, because we did it old school, because we did it old school, it took us like a lot longer, of course. It took us 1,500 hours just to enter the data manually and another 1,000 person hours to actually verify the accuracy of the data. That's a lot of time. But the good news is we got to pay a lot of students. And you have no idea how much craft dinner they got to buy as a result of all this work we gave them. Well, at least that's what they told us to use the money for. Okay. Now, that's something that we could do with the data. The other thing we're going to do throughout this whole research is collect qualitative data. And you know what that is now. So here's some examples. 
Here's actually examples from patients that I see and that I haven't seen not that long ago. Of course, I'm not going to give names, but this is the kind of thing that I hear. Here's one. The insurance denied my claim for five years despite countless letters and reports from health specialists. I eventually won my appeal, but five years was more than sufficient time to lose my house, car, and family. And the depression didn't help either. Here's another one. I get to hear this one from time to time, actually. There's, there's an N of several here. I knew I had a shot at getting back to work because I had such strong support from my manager and my coworkers. Or the return to work process was more stressful than my illness and injuries. In fact, it was the biggest obstacle in my return to work. I've heard that a few times. Or I've also heard, I wish I had access to the care that was really required. The reality is that I needed a psychologist and psychiatrist, not a life coach necessarily, or a 1-800 number. I wish my benefits gave me access to better care. Or fairly recently, someone said, I remember sitting in my hospital bed right after surgery and receiving a call from my insurer that right then and there to start discussing return to work accommodations. I'll skip over next steps. Maybe I'll save that for another talk. I think I will save future directions as well. I think I'd like to summarize because I want to leave you with a final message. So by summary then of our time together here, and you've been so, you've been so lovely and patient after lunch in a warm room and, and listening to some psychologists babble for almost an hour. Um, so by way of summary, I started with an introduction of my, myself, I guess. One of those things weren't true. I'm actually not a researcher. I, I made a profound com confession about my love for baseball, and part of its attraction is that it lends itself to studying, and by studying it, you can truly appreciate it. Baseball has immortalized its players. How? It records a lot of data. And baseball, by also documenting its history by way of quotes and anecdotes, allows for insightful inquiry. Now. Mining collects a lot of data, too. But if you want to find out about the mental health and well-being of people in this workforce, you are really out of luck. And this is too bad, because mining is part of the reason why we've become such a prosperous country. This is also unfortunate, because effective mining will only be as effective as the people who are working in the industry. Now, the good news is this. There's this marvelous place on campus now called Crosh, Orchidus, that has decided it would involve workers in the community and unions, business leaders and NGOs. And a current research effort was made possible by the leadership at Ballet and USW, uh, people like Keith Hansen, who is here today. Thank you for coming, Keith. You've been such a great leader for this project. Um, Whereas the quantitative data will help us explain results, we're going to do qualitative data to give all this, all these results some meaning. So, oh, by the way, I think the data is going to be more important than baseball data. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Because it's one thing to know what someone's batting average is. It's quite another to know who's down there feeling depressed and maybe suicidal today, whose life is being torn apart through the death of a family member or through a separation or something else, or maybe they just had a bad morning with their teenage son. That's important data. It really is, because one piece of data keeps us entertained at the ball field. Another piece of data contributes to the lives and the well-being and the prosperity of a country. That's just my own opinion. Just one guy. Now, I want to leave you with, with a final story. And this is the take-home message I'd like to leave with you. Franklin Roosevelt, he was the 32nd president of the United States. And he served some of the, during some of the worst times in that country's history. It was the era of the Great Depression and World War II, but it was said that he lifted himself from his own wheelchair to lift the nation from its knees. 
And when he died, as the funeral train carrying his casket pulled into Washington's Union Station, a reporter approached one mourner and asked that mourner, why are you crying? Did you know the president? The man raised his moist eyes and said, no, but he knew, he knew me. No, but he knew me. I think that's an extraordinary legacy of effective leadership, knowing the people that you are leading. And that's my take home message for you today. Get to know the workforce that you're leading. Do it scientifically. Do it collaboratively. Do it transparently and safely. Then please, I urge you, do something with the results that are produced from those efforts. So thank you. It's been a real treat being with you today.